right? What the Quran describes is beautiful. This list goes on and on. You know, and I began to write down everything I could remember. Then I said, now what does the Quran tell us about God? First thing that came to mind, nothing compares to him. There's nothing like un a reason to not embrace and to tire. Well, you guys took all the words on earth, you cannot encompass the words of God. You know, even if all the world, all the trees were pens, and all the seas and seven seas added to it, uh, you know, was ink, your words could never uh, circumscribe the words of God. You know, all this, you know, God is infinite, outside of, you know, anything you can compare him to. I thought, wait a minute, you know, is that it? Is that what the Quran is telling us? And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, the Quran tells us a whole great deal about God. But I always, when I was reading, I'd always just sort of skimmed over it. You know, I thought it was just literary devices, you know, to punctuate passages or to begin statements. I think you know what I'm talking about. But the Quran talks about God's most beautiful names. You know, they appear on almost every page of the Quran. What does the Quran tell us about God? This, there's thousands of such references, and they're repeated again and again. So as the Muslim reads the Quran, this image of God that begins to build in his mind is not a physical image, but it's an image of attributes, of beauty, of what the Quran describes as the, attribute, the true attribute of beauty. And God, to God belongs, according to the Quran, all the attributes of beauty. He is the source of all that is beautiful. What, what does the Quran tell us about God? It tells us he's the infinitely generous, you know, the infinitely kind, the infinitely merciful. He is the merciful. That's why I say infinitely. He's the source. He is all the mercy comes from God. Compassion, right? He's compassionate, the compassionate one, the just. You know what I'm going to write here. He is the truth. He, he is, the, you know, he is the clement. You know, he's the defender of the oppressed, right? He is the wise, the peaceful, or the source of all peace, the loving, al wadu, and on and on. Are you following? The minute I thought about it, the minute I saw those two lists in front of me, you know, I realized, as I'm writing this list, I'm also writing this one. You know? Everything the Quran asks us to grow in, God is the infinite source of. So the more we grow in generosity, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's infinite generosity and to relate to that. The more we grow in kindness, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's kindness here on earth and infinitely more in the next life when all is stripped away. The more we grow, and the Quran tells us when we come into this life, God breathes something of his spirit into us. The seeds of all these things are in us. But as we live our life and make our choices, our moral and spiritual choices, we either nurture those things with God's help or we stunt them, as the Quran said. So the more we grow in mercy, the more we are able to relate to God's infinite mercy. The more we grow in justice, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's infinite justice. Here in this life, it's going to be more in the end. You know, when I explain this to my children, you know what they said to me? Daddy, that's the lamest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> They're only like 13, 12, and 10 at that time. So I said to them, guys, let me give you an analogy. This only takes a few minutes. See, let me give you an analogy. So, okay. Let me give you an analogy. Um, I'm just going to write something. Let me give you an analogy. <laughs> Let's say I have two goldfish, which I had when I was a little boy, a dog, which I had when I was a little boy, and three daughters, which I have now. I told you. No matter how much of my being I showered on that goldfish, and I tried to lift that goldfish because I loved that goldfish. I tried to have that goldfish experience all that I was. I, I dolted on that goldfish. I spent hours and hours and hours trying to let that goldfish, talking to that goldfish, loving that goldfish. But you know, I came to realize at some stage that that goldfish, well, it didn't matter I was there or not. <laughs> so you can only experience all that I am to a very small degree because it's primitive creature. But I told him, my dog Sarge, that I had was such a beautiful German Shepherd. He loved me. You know, he could experience what I was to a much higher degree 
than the goldfinch. Of course, he didn't really understand my ration, my logic. And he didn't understand, you know, a lot of my wisdom as it developed. And he didn't understand my deeper motivations and things like that and all my aspects. But he understood my kindness. He understood my protectiveness. And he appreciated it and my generosity. He understood those because he protects. He was a protective animal. He is a giving animal to some extent. You know, he's a loving animal to some extent. And he could experience my love. But I said, you, my children, are much more complex creatures than my goldfish. The more you grow in your attributes of beauty, the more you'll be able to experience and understand and relate to whatever beauty I, of mine I can impart on you, and vice versa. And I told them, so it is with God. In order to grow closer to some another being, we have to share something with them. So I, if I want to get to you closer physically, I move my body closer to you because we're both bodily creatures. If I want to approach you rationally, I approach you through your intellect because we're both intellectual beings, through argument. If I want to approach you emotionally, I approach you with sentiments because we're both emotional beings. How do we grow closer to God? He's not corporeal like we are. You know, he's not finite like we are. But the Quran, the Quran, we grow in beauty because God is the beautiful. All beauty comes from God. And the more we grow in beauty, the more we grow in, in our ability to receive an experience, like my kids could receive an experience, my beauty, we grow in our ability to receive an experience all that is beautiful. You know, God, the infinite fun of all beauty. Are you following me? <laughs> but I said, okay. That makes sense. And then I thought about it. Wait, Jack. You've been seduced. Because <laughs> it still doesn't explain. Let me go back to the other window. It still doesn't explain. <laughs> <laughs> it still doesn't explain. <laughs> still doesn't explain suffering. Right? Why do we need to suffer? Intellect. Why do we need intellect? Choice. Why do we need choice? Why do we have to go through all that? Why didn't God just program us? Pop us in and program us. Make us merciful, compassionate, forgiving, loving, etc. Program us. Are you following me? Well, those of you who are mathematicians in the audience, where are you again? <laughs> good, you make me feel good. <laughs> I feel like I got a little bit of support here. In mathematics, I'm not saying mathematics great science or mathematicians are great or rational. Come to a department meeting in our department, you'll realize that they're just big babies. <laughs> but, irrational babies. But in mathematics, though, when we actually are doing our science, and we're faced with a proposition, and we're wondering if all the conditions, all the premises are necessary to get to the conclusion. And so what we often do is we remove a premise and see if we can still arrive at the same conclusion. And so that's just what I did. I did it naturally. If you take away human intellect, if you take away human suffering, if you take away human choice, then do we experience and come to know, or even experience, let's say, do we even experience, can we even experience compassion? Can we experience and come to know mercy, or justice, or kindness, or love? Are you following me? Do you take away choice? Does kindness make any sense? I mean, what is compassion? You see a, a person in pain. And what do you do? You make a choice. Do I help that person? Or do I make my appointment and get my check for $2,000? Are you following me? It's a choice. And would it even have been possible if human, humans don't face any adversity in life? Of course not. Are you following me? And it's an intellectual choice. We weigh the consequences of these choices we make. Same thing with justice, same thing with love, truth. What is truth without choice? I never heard anybody say, you know, Jeff, that this computer is the most truthful computer on the market. <laughs> it never makes an incorrect statement. We don't understand make, never making an incorrect statement as truth. The minute we say truth, we know it implies choice. This person always chooses to do, say what's right. Are you following me? 